Today we have a very special caller with us from the inside of Rahway Prison, New Jersey. Uh, Max, Max, are you there? Yes, I'm here. You're going to have to speak up a little bit. Okay, can you, make, can you turn me up a little bit? Okay, can you hear me now okay? Can you hear me, Max? Testing one, two, testing one, two. Prison is the death of a poor man, poor man. Okay, I think we're good. So, we should be ready to record. You have a good shot. Violence and life behind bars have always been big subjects in rap music. And so who better to make jailhouse rap than inmates at the East Jersey State Prison here in Rahway, New Jersey, about 30 minutes from Manhattan. We are outside of Rahway Prison now, what was formerly known as Rahway, that is. Where the lifers group have just recorded and released their first rap record. I'm telling the kids, prison is like this. I've lived it for 11 years. As you can see, you know, there's nothing, there's no joke about this at all. Hmm. You know, you come in a young man, you go out old. And we just drove by on the way up here to meet Maxwell Melvins. That's you. Yeah, that's me on the me sitting on the bed, me on the cover again. I have like a lot of memorabilia. I just don't have it here. Mm. You know, this Whoa. was one of the, this the first this the first magazine of hip hop source. Yeah, yeah. And of course, they did a feature on me. Here. Nice. That's you know? crazy, man. Yeah, they did a feature on one of their first. picture again. It's a copy of my nomination when I was nominated. Wow. So you were nominated for that VHS. Yeah, that for the best for long form video. music video uh, against Peter Gabriel, Chanel Connor. Madonna. And Billy Joel. JFK, blown away. What else do I have to say? But while this tape was recorded live at Yankee Stadium, this one's from a place where the games can be deadly. Of course, uh, Madonna won, of course, you know, because uh, they were looking for something differently at the time. And like, like I said, I set out to do none of this became bigger than me. Mm. I set out with a mission to accomplish something and it turned into a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. What else did I have for you? Something else I had. I have a, for example, when I used to do interviews, and sometimes they come with some crazy questions. Yeah, I'm just looking at your levels. You can well, they, they used to come with some crazy questions sometimes. Yeah. I'd be like, uh, you know, I, I, it's just, just I'm not do gonna, you. No, I don't care. You, I'm just, you already met me, so you right, know how I roll, This is what I'm right? saying, too. So number just one, like, I have no problem with self-disclosure. Yeah. So I don't have no problem. I don't got nothing to hide. Yeah. I ain't got no problem with I mean, the, I'd say the most on the spot question yeah. is that I'll just ask you what you were in for. Oh, I got no problem you, with that. No, 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 no problem. That's the most like I ain't got intimate no, question like I'm going to ask you. No problem. I have no problem with self disclosure. I don't have anything to hide. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing to hide. Yeah. So I'm rolling on all these. You want me to cut and start again? Or? Oh, you're rolling? I'm rolling on everything. Everything's right. going. Let's go. Thank you, Maxwell Melvins. Yeah. All Very right. Definitely a pleasure. We're in your home right now. Thank you for having us here. I wrote some questions that I brought with me. So um, my name is Fury Young. I'm the producer of Die Jim Crow. And it's an honor to be here with Maxwell Melvins of the Lifers Group. Yes, thank so, you. Same. Absolutely. Thank you. So here we go. Why don't you just start off with telling us a little bit about where you're from? Well, originally I'm from Glassboro, New Jersey, but uh, most of my life I grew up in Camden, from mm -hmm. uh, Camden, New Jersey, which is not very far from here, right next to Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. I think last time I read about Camden, I was informed that it had the highest crime rate in America or something it, like that. Yes, it, abs it absolutely did. It was, in fact, the number one crime area in, uh, at that time. So when you were growing up, it was rampant? Uh, uh -huh. It wasn't as much as it is right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, because and one of the reasons for that is guys banged out fist to fist. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, because somebody got upset, you didn't just run and grab no gun. Mm-hmm. The, the closest thing to it, a guy might take a stick or something, defend himself and knock you upside your head. But mm-hmm. for someone bumping into you or something like that, you didn't have nobody just want to grab a gun and, and shoot you. Right, right. Back then, they just it was just something different about the people. There was more of a code. Yeah, way, there was more of a people. More respect kind of yeah. thing. Just like even amongst uh, criminals and thieves, you might not think, but there was a code among them. There were just like certain mm. things you wouldn't do against people or humanity at right, a particular right. time. Not that any crime is right, but they still, just like the mob had a code, you don't go and kill Joey's mother because Joey did something to you or something. So they mm-hmm. had codes and different things now. So tell us about your life prior to entering prison, because you served 32 years? Yeah, 32 years. Uh, before uh, entering prison, I was a little young kid. Like I said, I grew up in uh, Camden. Uh, uh, I had uh, 14 other siblings, brothers and sisters in wow. my family, pretty big family. Uh, uh, you know, I, I basically grew up, it was, uh, Camden at the time was uh, somewhat f- of a fairly decent area, very in- integrated area, you know, everybody Almost pretty black and, black and white. Yes, it was pretty much a black and white area, very industrial place at the time. Some of your major companies was in that area, so it was mm-hmm. very corporate at that time. And uh, myself, I went to Pine Point Junior High School mm-hmm. and... Uh, you know, where some of my brothers and sisters took towards home and other things in their life, I pretty much took to the streets and was uh, more so thrilled by that. Mm-hmm. You know, the action on the street, you know, like even far as us cutting classes, thought we was doing fun things. We used to just cut classes uh, and go down to the river and watch the, the bridge open and the boats go by, sitting there drinking a soda or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, we were doing things like that. Mm-hmm. And... um you know, some things just led to another. Like I recall the time I was, I used to spend a lot of time by Rutgers College. I lived right next to the Ben Franklin Bridge. Mm-hmm. And I used to go over there. They used to have a lot of activities over there, you know, inner city, swimming and all that. So I recall going through there sometimes. Security guard used to like try to run us off. You know, that we felt that was our home. That was our area. And uh, I recall one time I walked through there. Next time I walked through there, he told me to, Yo, get off it! Don't come over here no more. I have my dog with him, with me. So I took my dog to get him. So my dog ran after him. So my dog ran after him and everything. Nothing happened. He didn't see me no more. About two weeks later, I was going to shoe shop, shoe store to take and get some shoes repaired. And uh, I just happened to be walking. He pulls up. I don't have the dog or nothing with me then. Mm. Uh, he grabs me. He puts me in the car. He takes me to juvenile attention. So that was my first brush with him the law and, and, mm. and somewhat the system at that time for something so innocently in which I thought. Mm. But he didn't think so. It was a joke to me. Right, right. So I kind of went to uh, detention and my mother had to come and sign and get How released. How long were you in there for? Uh, uh, two days, I believe, I was in there. Mm-hmm. And at that time, it wasn't even a big deal. Mm-hmm. At that time, I didn't think, it wasn't frightening or nothing. It was just like, you know, juvenile detention at the time, soft, whatever fed you bread and cookies, entertainment, took you out pony ride and all them things. So it wasn't <laughs> no big deal or something. Mm. You know, that might even have had an impact on, you know, in future things that you became a part of. You know, hey, what's that right there? What are they gonna take us to ride horses and stuff and to show yeah, you, yeah. you know, yeah. So how old were you when you ended up doing the 32 years? I was 19 when I ended up uh, doing the 32 years. Mm-hmm. 19 years old. Mm. And, uh, what are you here for? I'm here for accidental homicide. The reason this came about, uh, me and a guy had uh, got into a confrontation because he finagled me out of some money mm-hmm. over some uh, drugs. He told me someone had robbed him. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I didn't believe it. So, you know, I went back to the place where he said curd and everything and uh, we got in a confrontation and uh, I was with another uh, fellow. And uh, the other guy had a gun in the car or something. I'm very angry at the time. And he said, Max, take this. So I grabbed it. So I get up to the guy that had beat me out of my money in them terms. I'll use those terms. We got in an argument. I said, I want my money or I want my drugs right now. 
So he said, I don't have them. They beat me. I don't have the money or the drugs. So I think I slapped him upside his head or something. I believe he took off running. I fired like four shots recklessly, just pow, pow, pow. During the course of that, an innocent bystander got hit. Hmm. Uh, innocent bystander just happened to be coming out the bar. And um, hmm. as that happened, people started coming over to me. Yo, why did you do that? Why did you do that? I said, I didn't mean to do it. I didn't mean to do it. You just shot the guy, the innocent guy for nothing. I said, I didn't mean to do it. So the crowd became enraged, was coming in roar and mad. And, you know, like they wanted to attack me. So, so I left. I took off. But what I found out a few days later, you know who I got killed? My best friend, my childhood friend who I hadn't seen in three years, who moments before that happened, I had just greeted him. We hadn't seen each other in three years. It was my best childhood friend that got killed. Wow. That got struck by that bullet. Hmm. My best friend. Not that it was right for anybody, you know, not that I didn't have the same feelings about anybody getting hit, but I'm just saying how, sure. how, how strange. It's a very strange twist of fate. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I found out that happened. I was frightened, you know. Like I said, I didn't know at that particular time it was him still, but I was frightened. So I tried to avoid apprehension, mm -hmm. and I left for about a week. And then the more I was thinking about it was my friend. I was in New York. I came back to Jersey in the process of turning myself in. And from there, you know, I, I, I got arrested. Uh, I went to the county jail, had a high bail. Uh, during the course of that, uh, my friend's family, the victim's family had come to visit me. They couldn't believe it. Everybody mm -hmm. saying, you shot him. You shot my brother. Nah, and they saying like, nah, Maxwell didn't shoot my brother. Maxwell didn't shoot my brother. And I was like, if he died as a result, of that bullet from that night, that was me. Did I shoot him? No. Did my bullet hit him? Yes. If you want to be a loser like me, and if this is what you want, you know, come. But I'm giving you a choice, and I'm telling you firsthand experience. This is something that you can't get out of a textbook. I want them to realize that if they choose a life of crime, um, you know, that this is where they end up in, you know, the belly of the beast. From jailhouse rock to jailhouse rap, it's powerful stuff. The belly of the beast. The first rap song and video recorded and shot in prison, East Jersey State. Maxwell Melvin organized the whole thing. He's got a message for the kids. A lot of them will say, well, this is the problem out here. I have no other choice, you know? And I'm telling you, you do have a choice, so don't tell me a damn thing about what's happening out there right now, because I'm telling you, what you're doing out there right now is going to lead you here. And I can, like, just about touch both walls. I mean, I'm yeah, a small person. I, yeah, this I, is not a big space. Much, I pretty much can touch both walls in here. Yeah. And uh, this is one of the things that we do. Uh, as You'll get a tour of it, which is four wing. Okay. You'll see which is even a smaller cell. And uh, we kind of use these cells in our program, in our format with the Juvenile Awareness Program to show the kids if four guys were to roll in one of these little cells on you, show you how hopeless and helpless oh, you are. you have no place to go. You know, you, you have no, no place, place to, to run. Go. You're trapped. That's it. And from here, we'll go over there, and I'll let you see, and you'll see even a smaller cell, much smaller cell. So uh, I was uh, given that sentence and uh, 25 to life. 25 to life. Meaning before I could even be considered for parole, I would have to serve 25 years. 25 years. And man, when I heard that 25 to life, man, I, I didn't know what to do. Devastated, mm -hmm. you know, clogged head, anything. You know, I, I didn't know, you know how I was going to get through that. Well, when you come to prison, you're given a number. Um, so you're losing your identity right there. I'm not known really as Maxwell Melvins. I'm known as 66064. <laughs> Right now, this is not a black problem, this is not a white problem. Every kid problem out there. Because you only got one life to live. Take it from that. You don't want to end up in here for the rest of your life.